Well, hello. Hope all of you are doing well. So before we tee this up, let's make sure that all of us kind of are on the same page. So I would like to ask a question. How many of us live in a city that has blatant infrastructure needs? I do, okay, most of us, okay. Uh, and as she stated, how many of us live in a city or state that does not have enough money to cover the expenses of those infrastructure needs? Okay, most of us. Here's another question that I wanna ask. How many of us live in cities or states where we can unequivocally say that over 50% of our citizens understand the true issues with our infrastructure? And see, that's the thing we wanna deal with today. It's that although we've got all of these great infrastructure problems and these great infrastructure needs, sometimes understanding the problem takes a little bit more than just knowing that there is one. So, my name is Justin. As she stated, I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, a great Southern jewel, 175,000 citizens strong. And we have, like I am sure you do, very big infrastructure issues. In fact, when this administration came into office in 2014, we were not only uh, inheriting a $14 million deficit in budget, we also inherited a consent decree from the EPA and the MDEQ, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality, that said that we had to fix some of our water wastewater water practices in the city. And that set us back, you guessed it, moolah, to the tone of almost $400 million. That's just the consent decree, though. On top of that consent decree, we then had to take an assessment of our infrastructure in which our citizens were crying and moaning and sad about. And that estimate told us that we needed to spend by 2031 a billion dollars on infrastructure improvements in our city. And guess what? 750 million of those dollars are nowhere in sight. So like you, our city has this big price tag on fixing all of these issues that have been going on for decades. 100-year-old pipes, hundreds of year old homes with old pipes and all sorts of issues, but no real money, no real funding source, and no real opportunity to fix those things appropriately. We saw articles and stories running about potholes swallowing school buses in our city. And we had to help people understand that what was running on the news and what they were seeing in media was simply a manifestation of issues that had been going on for a very long time. So my question to you is how do we as cities not just fix infrastructure, but fix mindsets? Because in a lot of instances, our citizens are only frustrated with the things that they see. They don't really know the real proclivities are the deepness of the problems that we faced. So we decided that we would take a different approach to infrastructure improvement. We decided that we would not be like the administrations of 20 to 25 years of just band-aiding. You know, hey, citizen calls and says, this street's bad, I need it paved. They pave it because they don't want to hear the citizen talk. We decided that, hey, you know, that's probably not the best methodology since that's not working for us. So. We had a mayor, Mary Arbor, who was interested in bringing data into the conversation for every single thing that we did. So first thing he does when we get in office is he realized that not only did we inherit this $14 million deficit in budget, this $400 million consent decree, this $1 billion price tag on infrastructure repair, but he also inherited this 1% sales tax self-imposed sales tax that citizens placed on themselves that was meant to generate between 13 to 16 million dollars a year for infrastructure improvement. He realized that if he could leverage that fund efficiently and effectively, he could make some real dents in the problems that we saw in Jackson. So he says, hey, before we spend a dime, before we spend a dollar, let's get the data together, let's get the plan together, Let's create this infrastructure master plan. Let's do with it what we can, and then let's go from there. So we create the infrastructure master plan. We decide that data is gonna drive everything we do with infrastructure improvement, infrastructure in prayer, in repair, excuse me. 
And essentially, we said, we've got to teach our citizens how to view our problems from a different lens. So I'll give you the same analogy that I give a lot of citizens that we talk to. Your house, or a house, is similar to the infrastructure of a city. Your streets, your bridges, it's like the outside facade of your home. Your pipes, your sewer lines, those good things, they're like the inner workings of your house. Have you ever driven by a really, really pretty house and you've looked at it and you're like, ooh, I would love to live there, but if you knew the people that live there, they would probably tell you that it's probably not the house you want to live in because the things inside of it don't actually work right. We had to help our citizens understand that what they wanted us to do was paint the house without fixing the things inside of it. They wanted us to put a fresh coat of paint and a new roof and new shingles on the house when the house had plumbing issues, when the house had foundation issues, when the house had mold. And so when we explain that to citizens, we try to help them understand that the underlying issues that we face in infrastructure far outweigh these pretty little band-aids we like to call paved streets. And I know that sounds really, really strange because we're talking about infrastructure improvement. And I'm saying that the biggest deal is not the black gold on the street. But we had to get them to understand that if we could make the invisible visible to them, maybe they would give us a better opportunity to actually address the issues that cause those defects in the fronts of their houses, that cause those defects in our roadways, that cause those potholes, those sinkholes, and those eroding masses that fall through the, uh, the midst. So with Socrata, our team, we decided, hey, we're taking this house analogy to streets. We're taking it to communities. Let's also put it in a place where people can actually see, comprehend, understand, and follow along with the repairs we're making in our house. Let's let them see that we're taking the plumbing out of room B. We're fixing that plumbing. Room B's got a fresh paint of coat. We might not have made it to the front of the house just yet, but trust me, we're going room by room. We're effectively and efficiently using the dollars that you've given us to rehab your house. And when we did that, we, we showed them this portal, this Capital Projects Explorer portal, in which we list over 39 projects. And I'll add that less than half of those projects are actually streets. The, the majority of those projects deal with drainage. They deal with bridges. They deal with water and sewer line repairs because those were the real issues that were eating up streets, that were eating up things in our city. It's funny, though, that although those things were the culprits, the only thing that got talked about on news and in articles and in media were these things called potholes. That's all people wanted to mention was that this street hadn't been paved in seven years. When the reality of the measure was, if we don't fix what's happening underneath the sub-infrastructure of this street, it won't be a street in seven more years. And the reality is that we all face similar situations. This Capital Projects Explorer helped us show our citizens where their money was going, how their money was being used, how we were leveraging our data to understand exactly where the problems and issues were arising from. And then it gave us the opportunity to instilling them a little bit more trust in city government. I don't know about you, but I think that every city government can say that sometimes we've got citizens that are a little bit wishy-washy with their ability to trust us. And so this was our mechanism and our effort to bring data to every single infrastructure challenge. And not just every single infrastructure challenge, but this is our mentality when it comes to dealing with challenges, period. If we put the data in front of us and let the data lead the conversation, if we let the data lead the narrative, then we have the ability to have a viable conversation with constituents who may not be aware of what's really happening. And so, as you can expect, when you bring data to people and you start telling people no, like, hey, I want Left Street paved, like tomorrow, no. When you start saying no to people, they want to understand 
a little bit more about why you're saying no. They want to understand your methodology and your thinking. And so this house analogy and this data and this bringing it to their doorstep and showing them exactly what was going on underneath their streets has helped us get a little bit of an understanding when we have to say no. See, our commitment is not just to do work. It's to do work the correct way. And if we're not going to do work the correct way, then essentially we hurt the city. And now that methodology of doing work the right way, although it may ruffle a little feathers, a few feathers here and there, we've started to see benefits. We've started to see results. Funny thing is, I made this slideshow, submitted the slideshow about a week ago. And the first stat says that we've got over 70 streets paved and counting since we've started using this Data First initiative because people actually understand what we're doing and they'll get out of our way now. I said 70, but a week ago that number was 70. Today, I just got updated, that number is 87. Over 87 streets and counting. That sounds like a big fresh wind of momentum to me that our citizens haven't seen. That's the most in the last decade for paved streets in our city. Not only have we done that, we've instituted over 30 projects in the last two years with 1% sales tax, which was an allocation of over $40 million to streets, bridges, and drainage. We've got a team right now at Envision America 2017 giving a similar speech to this, talking about a new project, a sub-infrastructure project, in which we'll be asking to go a little bit deeper into that study, putting sensors and placing things in the ground so that we can understand our assets. And honestly, what we've seen is that we've been able to take this data and have a holistic approach to see results happen across our city, not just in infrastructure improvement, but even in aesthetic improvement with clearing dilapidated houses and unsightly properties. So my challenge to us would be that if we're going to use data to drive decision making, then let's use data to drive decision making the correct way. Let's ensure that our citizens understand exactly what's going on in the back rooms so that even when they give pushback, there's always validity to the methodology. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, we have a really fun topic today, and that's the uh, Flint water crisis. Uh, my name is uh, Frank Slut. Just a little bit about me. I've worked uh, three years for the Michigan Office of Good Government. We focus primarily on performance management. And uh, we uh, have been working since 2014 with uh, Socrata primarily on our Michigan dashboards, but also on our Michigan Open Data Portal. And we're also going to be moving our Flint dashboard, our Flint Action Tracker, as the branding is, uh, over to the Perspectives platform sometime later this year. So we're really looking forward to that. And uh, I designed the Flint Action Tracker, which is our Flint transparency site. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So the challenge, uh, as many of you probably already know, uh, there was uh, a serious water contamination issue that happened in the city of Flint. Uh, and uh, uh, some lead contaminants found their way into the public water supply and it created a massive uh, public health crisis. Uh, and this precipitated a need for the state government to move quickly and efficiently to resolve that issue. So Governor Rick Snyder decided to bring in the National Guard to help resolve that issue. And uh, first order of business for the Guard was to create a strategic plan. You can see it right up there. They called it the uh, Flint Dashboard. It's essentially a strategic plan, and it was built around uh, five primary goals, uh, four of which were revolved around resolving the immediate crisis. Uh, and the last one was about implementing a framework to make sure that something like this could never happen again. Uh, that, uh, that final goal isn't really being focused on so much in our transparency effort right now, but we're hoping to integrate it later on. Uh, the four other primary goals revolve around uh, water, particularly water infrastructure, uh, health and human services, uh, education, and employment and economic strength. Uh, those primary goals uh, cascaded down into our 75-point plan, which is essentially just 75 uh, independent uh, strategic 
uh, action items that we determined to be the most important things that needed to be resolved uh, before this uh, crisis could uh, really be uh, moved past. And uh, cascading down into uh, those, we were measuring those with what we call the key outcome indicators, kind of our own spin on key performance indicators. And that was basically the impetus of what the Flint action tracker was supposed to be, basically just a transparency site for those key outcome indicators. Uh, there was a lot of pressure from the executive office, from department leadership, and from the city of Flint to uh, create a transparency site to try and build public trust back up after the crisis. And uh, the outcome of that was uh, the Flint Action Tracker. So our approach, we really wanted to make sure that uh, the people of Flint and all of the different stakeholders that had coalesced together to resolve this crisis uh, were being taken into account. So we decided to create a series of town hall style meetings uh, that were conducted with some key stakeholders, primarily nonprofits like uh, Flint Cares or Water for Flint, uh, also Flint residents. There were a lot of very engaged, enthusiastic Flint residents that were very, uh, uh, provided some very key feedback and very important uh, perspectives on the crisis that helped us uh, better frame our, our transparency efforts, as well as city officials. It was really key to us to work with the city of Flint in a collaborative way uh, to help resolve the crisis. And what we learned uh, from these uh, stakeholder meetings, these town hall meetings, was that uh, primarily all of the stakeholders wanted to expand the scope of the transparency site beyond the strategic plan that had been developed by the National Guard. Uh, they wanted a Flint dashboard. They wanted all kinds of data about the dashboard. Um, they really didn't want to waste this crisis on just resolving the water issue. Uh, there were some other systemic issues uh, that had been going on with Flint uh, before uh, the water crisis. And now that there was a lot of attention uh, from all these different stakeholders, they wanted to leverage that and hopefully uh, resolve some of those issues as well. Uh, so we were more than happy to oblige and include that data as well. And from Flint residents, what we heard was uh, as, as much as they enjoyed seeing the data and hearing about our accountability efforts, uh, some of it was a little more technical and esoteric than, than they really uh, were used to or necessarily needed. What they wanted was information about how to, uh, how to uh, you know, resolve the, the crisis in their own lives, uh, how government resources were being used to help them and their families, and we wanted to provide that information on our transparency site as well. We didn't want it just to be about data. We also wanted it to be about people. So that's what we did. Uh, we created the Flint Action Tracker. Uh, the really easy part ended up being just designing uh, visualizations for the key outcome indicators, which was kind of all we had planned to do in the first place before the stakeholder meetings. Uh, and I'm sure once we uh, integrate the Socrata perspectives later this year, building out those visualizations will be even easier. Uh, but what was a little more difficult was identifying targets for those key outcome indicators. Uh, in our strategic planning phase, uh, the targets hadn't been identified. Uh, so uh, that created a little bit of controversy, but we'll get more into that uh, a little bit later. Uh, also, we wanted to expand the scope, uh, particularly around public safety, uh, quality of life data, and Flint government data. And uh, we also wanted to focus on creating kind of a uh, community-centric uh, uh, resource center for citizens to go to to learn more about how they can uh, best leverage what was being done in their communities to help themselves and their families through the crisis. So just delving into some of those issues a bit more. Uh, one was establishing targets. At the onset of our strategic planning phase, uh, we hadn't fully identified targets, so that came a little bit later. And those targets uh, all came out as annual targets on our, on our measures, uh, but none of the measures were being reported upon annually. All of them were either being reported upon monthly or quarterly, with a few exceptions. And uh, a lot of the departments were reticent to uh, share those targets and and really relate their progress. As you can see the line over there, the thumbs were going down a lot of, on a lot of these measures because the annual targets uh, were larger 
than what they were accomplishing on a month-to-month -month basis. So they really wanted to break down the targets into their own reporting periods so that if uh, they're on track in February but they're not meeting their annual target necessarily, they're still being deemed as on track and thumbs up. It was very important we managed to resolve that by working with the departments to uh, find the best way to curate the targets and the data. Uh, expanding the scope uh, was pretty simple. We worked with uh, Flint City uh, Government and the Flint Police Department to find uh, data on public safety, primarily crime data, arsons, uh, vehicle theft, homicide rate, things of that nature, things that were critical to Flint residents. Uh, also quality of life data, which I never would have thought as being so critical, but actually things like blight remediation, blight complaints, pothole fixes, and, uh, and miles of bike lanes were actually very critical metrics for Flint residents and some of the most uh, some of the most important metrics that we've put out there in terms of uh, site hits. So we actually uh, found out that the quality of life and neighborhood data uh, was actually very key. And uh, we learned that from our stakeholder meetings with Flint residents. And also uh, the Flint government was nice enough to include Flint uh, government fiscal data, uh, primarily around their budgeting. Uh, we worked with Flint to expand that. And you can see represented right over there, we kind of mocked up our own Socrata landing page, since we haven't been able to integrate this on Socrata, but we kind of borrowed the look and feel until we're able to migrate over to Socrata. And finally, we wanted to create uh, citizen resources or community resources. Uh, like I was saying, the, uh, the technical nature of a lot of this data, especially as it pertains to environmental issues, uh, was a little bit uh, esoteric for just average citizens, even some stuff uh, that I, I don't understand, the main significance of extended sentinel sampling and uh, on blood lead levels. But uh, what uh, citizens really cared about was how they can leverage what was being done uh, on the nonprofit level, on the state government level, and on the city and county level to help them and what was being done uh, to help protect them and their families. Uh, so for instance, uh, we have the school meal data there. Now the measure is just a percentage increase in school meals over the previous year. This is a very important KOI, and uh, it's critical to uh, the Department of Education and Department of Health and Human Services. But it's, uh, it's not necessarily something that uh, Flint residents uh, are particularly interested in, what they were interested in, is how are school meals affecting the resolution of the water crisis? And it just so happened that uh, the Michigan Department of Education, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services had worked together to try and find a way that school meals can use uh, nutrition to help combat the, uh, the early onset uh, and prevent uh, development of Legionnaire's disease in children. Uh, so uh, that, uh, we have a little link right there which provides information on uh, nutritional facts to uh, combat lead poisoning as well as, um, or lead exposure I should say, as well as uh, uh, information on uh, signing up for school meal programs, reduced school meal programs, things of that nature, things that are critical to uh, citizens uh, of all kinds all over the state, in particular in Flint. Uh, so just uh, to finish up, a few lessons learned. Uh, overall, I would say uh, take into account all of your stakeholders. It can be really easy to have a strategic plan and say this is our, you know, this is our plan. We're going forward. You get a little bit of tunnel vision, but it's important to look around and see who you're really affecting with this and getting their perspectives on that. And that's really what we were managed to do uh, with our stakeholder meetings, our town hall meetings and get a lot of feedback on what we should and shouldn't be putting on this uh, transparency site. Uh, you want to ensure that the targets are assigned early on in the process and that uh, they are clear and present throughout because that really did cause us a lot of problems throughout the process of not really having targets, uh, a lot of uh, controversy resolve, revolving around the targets. Uh, so making sure that those are done early on in the strategic planning uh, process is really critical. 
and just kind of a philosophical thing, it can, uh, in a crisis, uh, government transparency is important. Government transparency is all about building trust between the government and the community. And in a crisis, that is critical. That's very important. That's certainly something that Michigan wanted to, to facilitate, um, given, uh, given how uh, widespread and uh, very, very prominent the Flint water crisis was. Uh, so we weren't afraid to put our uh, data out there, and I think uh, everyone should kind of uh, follow that lead. Uh, and just in general, people really want to know about uh, government accountability data. People are interested in what information uh, the government has to provide for them, and uh, putting it out there can really be an effective tool to uh, resolving major crises like the one we had in the city of Flint. So any questions for either Justin or myself? All mm, right. Oh. If you could say where you're from, too. Hi, my name is Angela Dorsey. I'm from the uh, National Archives and Records Administration here in um, College Park. Um, my question is regarding the um, performance dashboards that you created in Flint. So um, I guess one of the concerns that I have, um, just based on my limited knowledge of the situation, is that you're dealing with a user population that may not necessarily be familiar with data sets, so what you're putting out there. So was there, you know, in terms of telling the story to your user population, did you do any comparisons between uh, some other cities in the state of Michigan and comparing it to um, what the toxicity is in terms of the, the water levels in Flint so the citizens in Flint can have an understanding in terms of, um, you know, this is where you are in terms of Flint and this is where other cities are. So they can, they can kind of understand the disparity if there's one that exists between, you know, how resources are being allocated throughout the Sure. Throughout the state. Uh, we didn't do anything quite like that because we didn't want necessarily to point out, uh, you know, disparities between Flint and any other cities in Michigan. Uh, but primarily what we did around benchmarking was uh, making sure that the targets that were identified were the, uh, were the correct targets, were what was considered uh, successful and average among uh, all city governments across the state. So it was mostly about focusing on uh, what data was, uh, or what, uh, what kind of targets were considered uh, average, normal. So in a way, we were benchmarking through the targets, through our experts in the Department of Environmental Quality, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and so on and so forth. Uh, rather than benchmarking against other cities. Uh, in particular, there is a huge political dimension to that that we really were trying to move away from. We didn't really want to necessarily make this a, a political argument between one city and another. We wanted to focus on how can we resolve the issue in Flint. So to that point, I was just thinking that the way that the Flint crisis developed that there might be a level of skepticism among the citizenry. And I think a lot of municipal governments deal with, I can put data out there, but you know, are people gonna hear what I'm saying? Are they gonna believe what I'm saying? Or are they gonna feel like it's been spinned to a point so it looks the way we wanna look at, at like? Did you have to deal with that? And how did you overcome perhaps some skepticism that you might have faced? We haven't done, I uh, had, had to deal with that since we launched the site, but early on in the planning process, particularly in our town hall meetings, there was a significant amount of skepticism around what a transparency site would mean, and that's specifically why we conducted those town hall meetings and why we brought in Flint residents and why we brought in the nonprofits uh, that were around Flint and the Flint city government. We wanted to make sure that everyone was at the table, everyone had been consulted on these transparency sites, so that the measures and the data and the targets were what uh, they considered to be effective and efficient and fair to the community. This is uh, Lincoln Chandler from Gary, Indiana. Um, I had a question for Justin. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the analogy of you know, uh, what you see might not necessarily be the most pressing issue. Um, 
and I'm just curious to hear a bit more about how you were able to make that case. Um, I mean, arguably, were you able to see a reduction in potholes uh, on certain streets and things like that? Just say a little more about that. Yeah, uh, I'll say we were able to make the case because uh, for, 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 for on one hand, um, it kind of goes back to, the, to this question that was just asked. Um, we had to be able to not have information out there that seemed like we were spinning. And some stuff is just blatant. So we used what we saw to help us defend what people couldn't see. The fact that we've, we've fixed over 3,000, uh, excuse me, 3,000 uh, water main breaks in two years means that we have a water main break, we have three water main breaks on average a day. That's insane. The fact that we've fixed over 70,000 potholes in the past three years, that those types of statistics and those types of things that we can show and tell citizens help them understand that, no, we're not saying that we're not gonna deal with what you see. But what we are saying is, if we're gonna continue to spend money on what you see, we're gonna have to start spending more money on what's causing the things you see to actually come to fruition. And so there are a lot of different things that, you know, we, we, we didn't get a chance to mention, but kind of in a similar situation to Flint, we've got dashboards and we've got all these things behind the scenes that we show citizens and that we show our department heads and that we hold our directors accountable to because those are the types of questions that people ask us. I know you're fixing the plumbing in my house, but when are you going to get to the shingles? And so we have to tell them <laughs> in a realistic manner that you know, we'll be able to do phase one here, phase two here, phase three here, but this is why we're doing it in this order. And so that's a good question. Hey guys, this is, oh, hello. Hey, Cam. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. This is Cam from Socrata. My question is, does, um, and this is for both of you, does the presentation of the data and understanding uh, the data and communicating what's happening with infrastructure in these two cities help in any way to get grant or federal funding or you know attention to it to help win that funding in the long run? You wanna go first? Sure. Uh, overall, uh, if we found that uh, because of the very serious issue and partially because of the federal government's involvement in the Flint crisis, uh, if we were failing on our key outcome indicators, which is the basis of our dashboard, uh, that was our strategic plan, which had involvement from multiple different stakeholders, multiple different levels of government. So though there's no actual built-in budgetary corrective actions that would automatically occur if we uh, began failing on any of those key outcome indicators, uh, there is, uh, especially as it pertains to water, there's certainly a good reason to believe that uh, more uh, budget, more funds, and more resources would be dedicated to resolving those uh, if they managed to fall behind. Luckily, that isn't happening. We're actually uh, ahead of schedule on a lot of uh, those issues, particularly as it pertains to water safety. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to make my answer brief because I know we're out of time. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we've got checks for 18 million, 6.7, 3 million, checks that'll prove to you that data makes a difference. And being able to present your case in a realistic manner, not just to your citizens, but to those people who actually have checkbooks who can write checks to fix stuff, it helps. And so, yeah, we've seen a, a, a great influx and increase in uh, our ability to gain grant money. I, I spoke and said we've been able to allocate 40 mil, over 40 mil uh, to infrastructure. That, that's not from our budget. So, so when you put those types of things in perspective, yes, absolutely. This is one of those things that push you in prime position to be able to go, not just with your hands out, but with a plan in your hand to someone who has a check to make sure that you can implement your plan. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.